Previously, we've talked some of the basics about how you select orbits. We're going to talk about some advanced orbital selection and some of the different types of specialty orbits that exist and why we might prefer using some of them over others. So the first thing we're going to talk about is orbital planes. Now this is an example of the Iridium, the original Iridium constellation. You can see satellites are moving in a particular direction, some up, some down, but they're such that they have complete overlap, that there's at least a yellow color everywhere all over the globe, although there are some regions where it's more difficult than others. Uh, because the Iridium constellation operates with a very high inclination, you see that the poles have extremely good coverage at all times. But uh, the rest of the Earth doesn't always have quite as, as great of a coverage. It just depends on how lucky you are. The closer the, you are to the equator, the harder it is going to be to have this kind of complete coverage. So when you have these planes of satellites, if you... You have to ask yourself, how much coverage do you really want and what angle of coverage to you is acceptable? If you really have to have 100% coverage, and Iridium prides itself on its ability to do that because you want to be able to have a phone call from anywhere in the world at any time, then you have to, to have a lot more satellites. The Iridium cluster is 77 satellites in order for it to work. And if any one of them is taken out of commission for whatever reason, then it won't work. And bad stuff happens. So, okay, we have the an example of, of what this might look like. Now, if you don't care as much about coverage, you could spread these apart. Maybe you only have four planes instead of seven planes, like the Iridium cluster. And if you do that, then it will, you can do the same types of things with a lot fewer satellites. Or maybe you decide that, like the, the SpaceX uh, Starlink constellation, that you really only want to have very high angle satellite beams, such that the satellite's almost direct all the, directly overhead. Well, these bubbles become much, much smaller. Your Iridium is relatively, data phone signals doesn't take a whole lot of bandwidth. It still takes a fair bit, but you can make do with a much smaller antenna. With the internet, you want much, much higher bandwidth. So this is an example of what the Starlink cluster system might look like, or Starlink constellation, excuse me. You're going to have far, far more satellites in order to maintain that coverage. And if you read the documentation, they're planning on launching thousands of satellites to make this internet work in order to have this high, high data system work across the entire globe all the time. Another specialty system is a sun synchronous orbit. And this is a little bit difficult to illustrate, but basically the satellite is in a slightly retrograde orbit, meaning that it is going, instead of most satellites go with the direction of the rotation of the Earth, well, this is going against it. And what will happen is they tend to pass over at the same time of the day every orbit. You can see the line of the Earth becomes the same even though you're progressing in future orbits. The, the Terminator stays at the same distance. So if you're looking down, it's the same solar time of the day regardless of which orbit you're in, which can be a very useful characteristic for Earth-observing type satellites. A lot of weather satellites are used in this kind of orbit. They've determined with a particular angle that you can stay in this retrograde orbit for forever and be at the same time of the day. I forget exactly what it is, but it's about 97 degrees inclination, roughly. So this is a very common orbit. Uh, some spy satellites will use it. A lot of Earth-observing satellites will use this orbit. Another one that is pretty common, and I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, is the Molina orbit. Basically, this is used for communication for higher latitudes. When you're, if you're at the the North Pole, you can't see a satellite in geostationary orbit at all. And if you're in Canada, then it's a lot harder to see it. Well, they figured out a way to make the communication a lot more reliable. 
for these areas. And what they do is they do a very, very inclined orbit. This inclined orbit has a couple of, of interesting characteristics. Um, first of all, you'll notice that the highest point in the orbit, as far as the latitude goes, is also the farthest point in the orbit in from Earth. And that is a very deliberate decision. This will allow you to give preferential coverage to one hemisphere or the other. So you can see that these loops right here, they happen, both of them, in the northern hemisphere. And it's a 12-hour orbit so that it'll be in the same place in the sky at the two different times of the day. And it will cover, as you can see, the United States here and it kind of hits India, China, uh, Kazakhstan, and, and Siberia, part of Russia, for the other part. This is one that might be used for a spy satellite if you were spying against the United States. And Russia had a number of, of satellites that were in this kind of orbit. They're the ones who discovered it. With three satellites in this orbit, you can actually ensure full coverage all of the time. And you don't have to move your antenna a whole lot to maintain the contact, although it's not as desirable as geostationary orbit that you just have a fixed point in the sky. This can be very useful for the higher latitudes. And also the, the high, highly inclined or, or eccentric orbit where the, the apogee and perigee have a significant difference can be useful if you want to give preference to one uh, one hemisphere over the other. Another interesting, it's kind of an orbit that can be done is around the Lagrange points. The Lagrange points are points between the Earth and the Sun or Earth and Moon or any two uh, heavy bodies where the gravity is relatively equal between the two. And so there are five Lagrange points of notice. Um, L3 is one furthest apart from, I, I'm just going to talk in reference of the Earth, Sun, Lagrange points. Earth three, L3 is the opposite point from the, the Sun for Earth. It's not a particularly useful place right now. The only thing that you might be able to do is to use a, a camera there to do some kind of parallax, but it's hard to communicate with Earth when you're at that point. You have the L4 and L5 points. These are the most stable points. And if you had, um, these actually have a lot of dust in them because a dust particles can enter in there and they can stay there for a long time because it's a relatively stable position. For some of the gas giants, they actually have a lot of asteroids and these Trojan asteroids is what they're called, these points. These, uh, we haven't actually sent any spacecraft to stay in these L4, L5 points because they haven't been particularly useful, but they could be used for a long stereo baseline to image the sun, for instance, or if we wanted a stable point that's far away from the Earth for a space station. There's some talk of using the Earth-Moon L4 and L5 points for that very purpose. The most useful ones as far as most astronomy-type purposes go are the L1 and the L2 points. The L1 point is an excellent point to be observing the sun. You can have a spacecraft that's pointed at the sun all the time. It will never go behind the sun. And you have your communication to Earth. It can be quite reliable as well. The L2 point can be really handy for spacecraft that need to be cooled. The James Webb Space Telescope is going to be in the L2 orbit because it needs to be cool relative to the Earth. So you can block out the Earth. You can block out the sun as far as the solar radiation goes, and then you have a much, much cooler spacecraft that you can use to maintain the low temperatures that they need to do. So, and there are other variants too. The L1 point is a great point to observe the Earth. There's, there's a spacecraft there that broadcasts an image of the Earth on a very regular basis that uh, can be used. You can see whatever the daylight side of the Earth is like. Well, thank you much for joining me on this journey. Please let me know whatever questions, comments you guys have about this or other stuff. And we will see you next time. Until then, keep on tracking.